Hi everyone. Welcome back to Talks in Class. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Jenna. I am your host and I'm so glad that you are here. I just got back from visiting my mom in Wisconsin. I was there for a little over a week. So if you're a regular listener of the pod, you'll see an episode next week that I recorded while I was there. So it's going to feel a little out of order because that episode will air after this one, but it was recorded last week and I am now back at home, my home, in LA. I had a great week at home in Wisconsin. I love going to Wisconsin in the fall. Fall's always my favorite time to be in like a colder climate. And I had a really fun weekend with my friends. I always have a good time when I go out with my friends from home, but like every so often we have one of those weekends that just is so funny and just so fun. It makes me laugh to look back on it. I remember when I was a kid, my dad would always comment how he would say my friends were my whole life. Like, oh, your friends are your, your whole life is your friends. And I think he meant this as kind of a bad thing back then. Kind of like, you know, when parents used to say, oh, if all your little friends jumped off a bridge, would you jump too? But it's true. I loved my friends. I really did. And I still love my friends, you know? I think it can be really hard to make new friends as an adult, but it can also be hard to just kind of maintain your friendships as your lives change and evolve, which is of course natural as you get older. But I have those friends, whether it's college friends or new friends that I have met in my adult life or those friends from childhood or high school or whatever, who I can go months or even years without seeing and then just still have so much fun around. And, you know, regardless of what friend group it is, I always just have so much fun being around my friends. So it was nice. And I got to see some people that I hadn't seen in a really long time, which is always a good time. So as always, I will start this episode with my what good happened. And honestly, you know what? My what good happened is that I made it through not one, but two nights out in Wisconsin without a raging hangover. And this is an accomplishment for me because it does not take much for me to get hungover. I have lost all of my Wisconsin drinking ability. So I have to really pace myself when I go home because I just can't handle feeling like garbage anymore, but I like to go out and have fun with my friends and I really did have a good time. And you know, I'm just really glad that I wasn't miserable for like 48 hours afterwards because it is just not worth it anymore. I think, I think this is maturing, you guys. Clearly I have a low bar for <laughs> my sense of maturity, but whatever. So this week's episode is one that I actually can't believe I haven't covered yet on the pod because it's something that I've talked about a lot with people on social media and I make videos about it. And it's just something that's so in the conversation when it comes to nostalgia. And it's related to one of my favorite nostalgia topics, which is the mall. <laughs> I love the mall. And it just feels like a topic that was so central to my experience as a teen in the early and mid 2000s. And that is Abercrombie and Fitch. As many of you probably know, one of my favorite things when it comes to 2000s nostalgia specifically is mall culture. <laughs> Just everything about the mall, mall stores, the way we treated the mall as a social hub and a source of inspiration, a place to work, a place to just hang out and kill time. And when I think about quintessential mall stores of the 2000s, there are a few that come to mind. Gadzooks, where I used to buy all my Bond Dutch gear. Wet Seal, where I bought all my cheap going out tops in the later part of the 2000s. Claire's, obviously Hot Topic. Stores like BB that I thought were really fancy when I was a teenager because everything had rhinestones on it. But possibly the most influential and definitely one of the most notorious stores, of course, is Abercrombie and Fitch. So I realized that I didn't really have any knowledge of Abercrombie and Fitch prior to about the year 2000. So I did a little research uh, and it turns out that Abercrombie and Fitch is very old. It was actually founded in 1892, which is wild, in New York. And it was an elite outdoor outfitter type of store. Basically it sold expensive things you would need if you were a rich man going on some sort of excursion, like guns and tents. It was a fancy rich man bass pro shop, I guess, essentially. And it had customers like Theodore Roosevelt and Ernest Hemingway, like this was very elite, which we know they really tried to 
keep throughout their history and their legacy, especially in the 2000s. And then by the late 70s, they shifted a little bit more towards clothing rather than like guns, but it was still really focused on that outdoorsy kind of customer. And then in the late 80s is when they started shifting more towards younger people and that started the evolution into the Abercrombie that we all knew, whether you loved it or hate it, you definitely knew it in the 2000s. A dimly lit store that you could both smell and hear from all the way across the mall, full of size double zero ultra low rise jeans and expensive polo shirts with staff that were all teens or maybe young adults, but they were like so hot that you weren't really sure if you were in a suburban mall or at MTV Spring Break. That was the Abercrombie and Fitch that we knew. It was a far cry from, you know, rich man Bass Pro Shop of its <laughs> origin. But being a kid in the rural Midwest, I don't remember ever even hearing about Abercrombie and Fitch until one very important and I think underrated boy band song was released in 1999. And that of course is LFO's Summer Girls. You know the song. I like girls that wear Abercrombie and Fitch. Chinese food makes me sick. I mean, this is poetry, okay? This is Y2K poetry from the band LFO. And I kid you not, I don't know if it was because I was a tween, a middle school kid, and we were just so susceptible to any sort of trend, but this song was so popular amongst myself and my fellow little tween middle school friends that it sparked this huge wave of Abercrombie popularity in my middle school. My friends and I were obsessed with it suddenly, and it was 100% because of this song. But because I was 12 years old, okay, I was a tween, and I was used to buying my clothes at Target, maybe Kohl's, JCPenney. I mean, not high-end stores by any means. My poor mother was in for quite a shock when I dragged her, probably quite literally dragged her into Abercrombie and Fitch for the first time. I don't think I need to tell anybody this if you were alive in the 2000s, but the clothes were so expensive, you guys. I'm talking $100 for a hoodie, and this was 20 years ago, okay? $100 for a hoodie is expensive now. This was in the year 2000. My solution to this as a scrappy little 12 year old was to shop the sale section at the kids store, which was just called Abercrombie, and it was all in lowercase. <laughs> it was like a cross from the regular Abercrombie and Fitch at the mall. And I actually still have some of my Y2K era Abercrombie kids stuff. It's all a size large or extra large. And actually one of the sweaters that I got from there, prob I mean, it had to have been in middle school, is, is so cute. I still wear it when I'm at my mom sometimes. It's this light bluish gray sweater, but it has a hood. So it's a hoodie basically, but it's a sweater. It even has the pocket in the front. I don't know. It's really cute. I, I actually really like it. So anyway, I dragged my mom into the kids Abercrombie store every single time we did a big shopping trip to the Mall of America, which was the closest really good mall to where we live. Definitely the closest mall that had an Abercrombie kids. And it was about two and a half hours away. So this was a trek to get there. But I felt so cool walking into seventh grade homeroom with my little hologram planner and my little gel pen in my American Eagle cargo pants with a new t-shirt that said Abercrombie across the front of it. And this was also around the time that American Eagle did all of the wardrobe for a season of Dawson's Creek. I think it was season three. It was one of the early seasons, obviously, which was absolutely genius, by the way, on the part of both the CW, which was still the WB at the time, and American Eagle because, I mean, what an easy way to sell your clothes to kids, right? You could watch Dawson's Creek and then literally go to the mall and buy the exact same clothes you saw Joey Potter wearing on TV the night before. I mean, this was genius marketing and I ate it all up, obviously. <laughs> and those two stores, American Eagle and Abercrombie and & Fitch, became kind of an identity for us kids in middle school. <laughs> around this time or an identity to aspire to anyway. And of course, again, anybody who was alive it, and in any way aware of Abercrombie in the 2000s knows that one, this was their ultimate goal, right? They wanted their brand to be aspirational. This is a word that we know now because of social media and influencers and stuff. I don't think that we were consciously aware of this type of marketing at the time, at least as a young person, I certainly wasn't, but 
The idea was that kids like myself growing up in a small town in the Midwest would associate a certain lifestyle with wearing their clothes. Identifying as an Abercrombie kid was the ultimate goal, right? That was the, their goal as a brand is for us to want to identify as an Abercrombie kid. And two, as we also know, only a very specific type of teen was in fact an Abercrombie kid. And this was purposeful. It was by design. It was exclusive because it would make you feel bad if you didn't fit in. But then the ones who did obviously felt like cool because they did. And it's all very gross, but it worked. You know, it definitely worked on kids like myself. The documentary on Netflix called White Hot, by the way, a couple years ago, it went into a lot of detail about this. And I really liked the documentary. I enjoyed it. We watched it right when it came out. I found it really interesting to hear from some corporate staff members and just people who were, were around and kind of close to very higher ups and kind of got that inside viewpoint on it during those times. But at the same time, like as a millennial who was a teen during the unquestionable peak of Abercrombie, like we know, you know what I mean? Like I watched it and it was interesting, but at the same time, we all knew this. If you ever set foot into an Abercrombie store, you already knew this. And if you worked at any one of these stores, you definitely knew it, even if you were just, you know, a stock person for a couple of weeks. But as a young person whose critical thinking skills had yet to be fully developed and I didn't really realize the marketing that was <laughs> happening to make me so obsessed with Abercrombie and Fitch, I loved Abercrombie and Fitch. And not just the clothes, which, you know, had to have a really conspicuous moose or logo or just Abercrombie and Fitch written in huge letters across the front so that everybody knew that you were wearing Abercrombie and Fitch, but all the other stuff, right? It was a whole lifestyle brand. We used the shopping bags to cover our textbooks or decorate the insides of our lockers, which were, yes, shirtless men. So we were walking around with like a shirtless dude on the front of our algebra textbook. And I guess everybody just let this slide. I, I don't know. I wore the perfume too. I loved Abercrombie 8 and I actually still love Abercrombie 8 perfume. It smells so good. It was not available on the website for months. I mean, probably over a year and everybody thought it was discontinued and this happens from time to time, but it recently came back on the website like six months ago and I bought a bottle and it smells so good and it's gone again, but I have faith that it'll eventually come back. I also somehow convinced my mom in early high school to buy me the quarterly a few times, which was their magazine slash catalog for Abercrombie & Fitch. And this was a large publication, okay? It was pretty thick, not quite JCPenney catalog thick if you're as old as me. If you're JCPenney catalog old, you understand this reference. It wasn't quite that big, but it was like fall issue of Vogue thick. It was, it was large and I'm pretty sure it was expensive and it was full of nudity, you guys. Not like the shopping bags, partial, like a shirtless guy with maybe the tops of his boxer showing. This magazine catalog, whatever it was, had actual real nudity. We're talking boobs, butts, maybe even some other things that were kind of blurred out, but there was, there was nudity. And I absolutely did not know this about the quarterly until I got it for the first time, which obviously, how would I know? <laughs> I probably just assumed it was like any other catalog and it was going to showcase the clothes, but I was very wrong and I never told my mom. I, I don't know what happened to all those quarterlies. I had a few. I probably tore out all of the appropriate pictures and hung them all over my walls and put them on my textbooks or whatever I was going to do with them. And then I probably threw the rest of the quarterly away so that my mom never found out it was full of nudity so that she would continue to buy them for me. I'm pretty sure they were wrapped in plastic at the store because they probably didn't want people flipping through them for good reason. And I really did always like the Abercrombie and Fitch aesthetic, even though it wasn't wasn't quite fully my personal sense of style. Their aesthetic was very preppy. It was, you know, very all American, but it just had this undertone of money, right? It was like teenage Ralph Lauren or something. I don't think that I understood the concept of old money by any stretch of the imagination, being that I grew up in a place where very few, if any, 
families could ever be considered like truly wealthy <laughs> in that way. But I just knew that there was something about the way that Abercrombie imagery just felt that screamed rich, right? Like it screamed money, not just the clothes, but just the vibes, the whole branding of the store was rich. And the models obviously were very pretty. They were thin. They had like naturally sun-kissed blonde hair, whatever, but they were naturally pretty. That was the whole thing. It wasn't makeup pretty. It was just this classic type of beauty, whatever that means in marketing. And it's really funny to me now to think about how this very natural aesthetic that they promoted in stores morphed into the teenage version of Abercrombie aesthetic that we turned it all into because as teens, like, we were not embracing natural beauty, okay? I mean, I wasn't a Hot Topic kid, but the amount of eyeliner I was putting on every day would maybe have you think otherwise. All of us teenagers were running around in our Abercrombie clothes alongside our super trashy, tacky, flashy Mick Bling styles like our Von Dutch trucker hats and my heavy black eyeliner and Playboy Bunny everything and our dark fake tans and our bleach blonde like streaky highlights. And this kind of became its own aesthetic, this teen girl McBling Abercrombie aesthetic. And Abercrombie was very much lumped in for teenagers into that McBling fashion, which is just so counter to what they were going for. And we just grabbed it and ran with it. It was a super short Abercrombie and Fitch mini skirt with flip flops or Uggs, a graphic tee with some very inappropriate innuendo on it way too much makeup, a fake tan, and a Playboy bunny belly button ring. Like That was the look that we decided <laughs> we were gonna go with. And I love this, obviously. I thought this was just 10 out of 10, so hot, no notes, amazing. But nobody that I knew, not a single person that I knew growing up or in college ever wore the true Abercrombie aesthetic, like what the store wanted it to be unless they worked at the store and they were forced to, which we will get to more, more on that later, stay tuned. But of course, you know, just like Lululemon later got into trouble for, Abercrombie and Fitch clearly made their clothes for a certain type of person. And they intentionally made it really difficult for someone who didn't fit that description to wear them. But of course, not very many teenagers, hardly any teenagers in, real life in America or anywhere fit what their identity of an Abercrombie teen was. So we took it and we made it something our own, which was <laughs> kind of trashy, but fun. You know, we had fun with it. And I wonder if that disgusting CEO who made all those comments about the Abercrombie and Fitch target customer or whatever was horrified looking around to see what the teens of America looked like with our two dark fake tans and our two blonde bleached hair while wearing their brand name that they wanted to be this very specific image just sprawled across our chests <laughs> every single day sprawled across our chest with our water bras i mean i i hope he was horrified because we were not looking like all natural girls next door not even close that was not our goal we were looking like super trashy little mall rats who probably reeked like love spell and the cheese sauce from the pretzel stand at the mall and we loved every minute of it we were not trying to be abercrombie girls <laughs> and not that we were in any way consciously trying to subvert this idea of an Abercrombie teen, but we kind of did, you know? We, we took that all-American image and made it delightfully tacky, like Hooters. <laughs> Sometime in early high school, I guess, I don't really remember specifically when it was, so I assume sometime in early high school, I also discovered Hollister. And I think I pretty instantly realized that it must be in the same company as Abercrombie, because if you walk into Hollister and you had no idea what it was, but you had been in Abercrombie before, it was clear that this was basically the same store, but just different, right? It was like the cool kind of laid back beach little sister of Abercrombie and Fitch, but it was very clear that this was from the same people because no other mall stores looked like this. Some mall stores had kind of loud music, but they still looked like stores, right? Like 
they had windows and a doorway and you'd walk in and the lights were on and the staff would say hello to you. This was not the case at Abercrombie <laughs> and Hollister. There were no lights. The music was blasting so loud you could hear it down the other end of the mall. The outsides of the stores didn't look like stores. They looked like a beach hut or they had like a porch or whatever. There were half naked men standing outside. That was a pretty good indication actually that you were going into an Abercrombie brand <laughs> store. But anyway, I, I know this is probably a hot take for some, but Hollister was always my personal favorite. I liked it better than Abercrombie and Fitch for a lot of reasons, but I think probably mostly because as we all know, I was very, very committed to the entire surf aesthetic, despite, you know, living in the middle of the country. And just anything close to beachy related things, I really loved as a teenager. I was actually fully convinced that I was going to move to California and live on a beach and have wavy, naturally like salt spray looking hair with natural highlights from the sun and wear flip flops every day. <laughs> So naturally, I really enjoyed Hollister, but I also liked that Hollister's clothes were a little bit more just fun. There was a little bit more going on at Hollister, a little bit more variety, especially in those days. You know, the Mick Bling mid 2000s years, it really was all about fun. Clothes were really colorful. There were rhinestones on everything. We know this, right? So Hollister actually sold colorful clothing <laughs> a lot more than Abercrombie and Fitch. Abercrombie's clothes were navy gray white maybe some burgundy i mean there just wasn't a whole lot of color happening in that store hollister had actual colors like yellow and aqua and like coral pink and green plus obviously a ton of white and brown and denim just like abercrombie and fitch and they had a lot of the same styles as abercrombie and fitch just in a hollister version which was often much cheaper I mean, it was still expensive for what it was, but if you could get essentially the same thing at Hollister versus Abercrombie & Fitch, like a polo shirt or a graphic tee, it was cheaper. <laughs> and I appreciated that, or I should say my parents appreciated that. Hollister also had the perfume August, which I think is the best perfume out of any of these stores that I ever remember. I'm so disappointed now like when I really think about it, I can't remember exactly what it smells like anymore. It doesn't come immediately to my mind anymore, but I do remember I absolutely loved it. It had this kind of woody, like citrusy, beachy scent. It was very outdoorsy. It had some floral, but it was a very unisex fragrance. And at that time, I don't remember any brand promoting unisex scents for women i mean it was the perfumes of those days that i remember wearing were like very very feminine and floral so this unisex like woody outdoorsy scented fragrance from hollister i mean i thought it smelled amazing i loved it it's discontinued but i still hold out a little bit of hope that maybe they'll bring it back someday I mean, for nostalgia's sake everybody's bringing everything back plea to hollister can we please get august back even if you rename it something stupid just bring it back and honestly, I think Hollister's stores were more fun to be in. Like the aesthetic was more fun. It was, it had the beach vibe, the surfy thing. There were surfboards and they had that screen. It was this big screen in the store and it would have a live stream of the pier at Huntington Beach. And, and obviously the iconic exterior of the store that looked like a beach hut with the porch where the models would stand and the shutter windows, which I've heard other people say this and now I'm so thankful that I wasn't the only one who felt this way, but I always remember feeling a little moment of panic when I'd walk up to a Hollister, even though now I look at it and it's very clear that the porch is elevated and that's where you're supposed to enter. But the shutter windows kind of threw me, like, were you supposed to go in there? Because it was intimidating to walk up onto that porch and then you'd either have to go right or left to go into one of the rooms, like the girl's room or the guy's room. You'd have to, I don't know. It always gave me a little anxiety walking in a Hollister because I wasn't sure where it was supposed to go. And now other people have admitted that they too thought that the shutter windows <laughs> were possibly entrances and I don't feel so bad. But Hollister also, this is really important, they played way better music. Abercrombie, I remember playing a lot of just aggressive club type music, which is 
fine. Like I like it. It was a lot of electronic kind of dance music, but I wasn't into that in those days, the way that I was into the music that they played at Hollister. Hollister played emo rock bands, basically. And I remember in those days, we would discover music in the wild because we didn't have Spotify to give us recommendations. Obviously, we had the radio and stuff, but you would discover a lot of music through media, but also through mall stores because mall stores often would have bands that were still kind of under the radar on their playlists. And I discovered so much music from Hollister because they had a screen in their store that would show the band and the song that was playing in the store, kind of like how MTV had the little ticker on the bottom of the screen that would show you what was playing while you were watching Laguna Beach or whatever. I'm 99% sure this is how I discovered Death Cab for Cutie was at Hollister, as embarrassing as that is. But thank you, Hollister. And in addition to Hollister, of course, there were these other Abercrombie offshoot stores. There was Gilly Hicks, which is still around. I think Gilly Hicks opened in 2008. I vaguely remember going to one in Dallas, I think, and buying a hoodie, and that was the first time that I saw it. But basically, Gilly Hicks to me just felt like Abercrombie's Victoria's Secret. It was sweats, lounge clothes, underwear, bras, things like that. And I think I never got into Gilly Hicks because in 2008, I don't think there was anything that I was more devoted to than Victoria's Secret pink. <laughs> I had those stupid little stuffed dogs all over my apartment. Every time there was a gift with purchase for those stupid stuffed dogs, I had to get one. I used their tote bags, you know, the also free gift with purchase that you'd have to spend a ton of money to get, but they called it free. I used those bags for everything, including as my school bag, which has permanently destroyed my right shoulder for all time. But I loved Victoria's Secret Pink so much, so I just, I don't think Gilly Hicks was ever gonna win over my loyalty just because it happens to be in the Abercrombie family. Although, that is a pretty strong argument for it. Maybe if I was a little bit younger, I would have converted to Gilly Hicks, but man, all the marketing that Victoria's Secret Pink did geared towards college age girls in the 2000s, I mean, it was absolutely genius, all of the stuff that they did, because I have never felt a brand as intertwined in my identity, I, I don't think, as I did about Victoria's Secret Pink in college. Like, you just could not escape it. It was clothes, it was bedding, it was they did the collegiate line. I mean, it was just so well marketed towards college age girls, and it worked. It worked on me anyway. And then there was the store rule, and it was like rule number, whatever, there was a number that was supposed to be an address. And I feel like this must have been really short-lived. Google says that the first rule stores opened in 2004, but I definitely didn't know about it until college, which was, you know, a couple years minimum later. I don't really know how widespread this brand ever became. I feel like nobody ever really heard of it. I don't ever hear people talking about it. We definitely had one in Dallas. I think it was at the Galleria. And I remember going to it. I remember going to it for the first time and being like, what is this? The whole exterior looked like a house, like a brownstone in the stores. But I remember walking in and again, having the sense that this is an Abercrombie store, but it's different. And I remember the salesperson giving me like the whole spiel about what it was. And what it was, was that Rule was supposed to be Abercrombie's more elevated brand, which yeah, they made a brand that was more expensive than regular Abercrombie and Fitch. Who did the market research that said that that was needed or wanted? By the way, this was in like the 2000s. Like by the time I discovered it, it was probably like 2008. Everybody was broke and they were like, hmm, a store that's Abercrombie but more expensive. That's a good idea. Like <laughs> what? But it was supposed to be aimed at a little bit older demographics, like a post-collegiate audience instead of high school and college age kids. It was supposed to feel more sophisticated, more luxurious, definitely like kind of that quiet luxury old money thing like that we call it now, but you know, like a Ralph Lauren. I think that was probably kind of what they were going for in terms of a competitor. Except I also definitely remember seeing t-shirts that just said rule across the front, just like Abercrombie or Hollister or American Eagle or anything else, but I don't know. 
But the thing that I remember about Rule are the stores, because if Abercrombie Brands did one thing is that they did their storefronts big. The store was supposed to be a house. So the exterior looked like a, a brownstone, I think. But when you went into the store, it was supposed to be like navigating through a house. So it was like rooms. And I just remember it was like really dark and there were these big brown leather couches in there, like huge and rugs and like pictures hanging on the wall. Like it was supposed to look like a house. I don't know if I will give Abercrombie and Fitch one thing. They were very creative with their storefronts. But of course we cannot talk about Abercrombie and Fitch in the 2000s without talking about the experience of working at Abercrombie and Fitch in the 2000s. Or aspiring to work at Abercrombie and Fitch because Abercrombie had the hottest employees. Everybody knew this. So working at Abercrombie and Fitch was the highest compliment. I don't even know if you could apply <laughs> to work there. I was approached to work there once, but I was, I think I was too young and also I lived far away, but you had to like have a certain look to work there. And everybody knew that store employees who worked on the actual sales floor were called model like that was your job title it was model it was not sales associate or any other normal job title it was model and i am sure that this was at least in some part a way for them to get away with mandating specific things about employees appearances down to their hair color their hairstyles their makeup their weight i mean it was highly problematic but still people wanted to work there and obviously a big draw of working at these stores was the employee discount again the clothes were really expensive so i personally would have done anything you know i would have worked anywhere to get a discount that was kind of like my goal for working at the mall was just to get a discount on the clothes but probably for the best we never had an abercrombie fish that was close enough for me to work there and i do think the one time i was asked to apply was kind of a fluke. I must have been dressed really preppy that day. I don't think my look would have quite fit <laughs> Abercrombie by the time I was old enough to work there. I had like bleach blonde highlights and like my tan was way too dark. I just, I did not look natural. But I did work at Hollister. <laughs> I think it was late summer in 2006, sometime in 2006. They opened a Hollister in the mall near me. It was a brand new store. I was 19. I had previously worked at Express at the same mall, again, for the discount, primarily. And I loved the idea of working at Hollister because, you know, surf aesthetic. So I guess I applied. I don't remember if I took in a paper application or if I just walked in and they were just so desperate to hire everybody they could find that they asked me to apply. I'm not really sure. But somehow I got called for this interview, which was a massive, very awkward group interview that took place, I kid you not, in the food court of the mall outside of Rocky Rococo's in a circle, which in hindsight makes total sense because the actual stores were way too loud and also too dark to conduct an interview of any kind. I mean, you wouldn't have been able to hear what anybody was saying or even see their face during the interview. But I did get hired and I remember having to sit through this really intense orientation, which also took place in the food court. And most of it was spent going over the extensive dress code and look policy or whatever. They had a name for basically all the rules about how you had to look and not just what you were wearing, how you physically had to look. You could not wear eyeliner. You could not wear black mascara. It was brown only, and they would literally make people wash it off. You couldn't have any sort of unnatural hair color. And that doesn't mean you couldn't have pink hair. That means you couldn't have like platinum blonde hair or like stripy highlights. It had to be a natural look, which I'm not sure exactly how I got away with that. I probably just scrunched it with gel and hoped that that looked beachy enough for them. You were only allowed to wear light pink nail polish or have bare nails, which was preferable, obviously, which meant for me, I had to remove my tacky, long French tipped acrylic nails. And I remember being so mad because those cost like $35 in 2006. It was like all the money I had that week. <laughs> I had to take them off for this stupid job. I also had to take out my nose ring. Obviously they were not going to let you have a nose ring, but it closed in one, one day that I took it out. It, it closed and that's why I don't have a nose ring anymore. And you had to wear flip flops every single shift. 
at all times in the store, you had to wear flip flops. Mind you, I live in Wisconsin. Okay, it, it gets like below zero for months on end and there are blizzards frequently in the state of Wisconsin. And I remember, still remember this pretty vividly, the manager saying something along the lines of, you know, like at some jobs you have to wear a uniform. Well, here you have to wear flip flops. It's kind of like your uniform. You know, you, you come to work and you put on your uniform here, you come to work and you put on your flip flops. So everybody had their little flip flops that they would wear for their shift and you'd come in in your Ugg boots or whatever and change into your flip flops, which we would stand in all day long rubber flip-flops. And then obviously the clothes had to be like in season and in the right colors. They made me buy skinny jeans. I still remember this was 2006. So this was very early in the skinny jeans thing. And I didn't fully convert to skinny jeans until like 2010, okay? I hated them, hated. I resisted so much. I remember thinking I looked like a ice cream cone or like a lollipop with these little, little legs. And like, I just thought they looked so awkward, but they were coming into the stores and they were trying to push them. So they made us buy them. And I remember putting them on with my little flip flops and like a baby doll tank top and thinking this is the most absurd silhouette. Like this just looks horrible. Why would anybody wear this? And none of the stores in those days, except maybe Rule, but none of the teen oriented Abercrombie brands, certainly not Hollister sold anything in black. Like they literally did not make black clothing. So they had this really strict policy against wearing anything black. Your flip-flops could not be black. You could not have a black cami underneath a sweater. I mean, no black clothing on your body, which I also remember being really horrified by because I loved wearing black. But anyway, honestly, there were just so many red flags in the whole interview and the orientation alone. I should have known better. Even at 19, I should have run for the hills. I also remember the manager giving us this whole little talk about using our discount to buy the clothes and wearing them and how basically that was our entire job. It was to buy the clothes and to wear them in front of people. I don't think they ever explicitly told us to be rude necessarily or to ignore customers, but it was made very clear that our job was to wear the clothes and look cute and absolutely not our job to be helpful <laughs> to people or provide customer service. I mean, we weren't taught to engage with people or talk to them or ask if they needed help. We were just supposed to kind of stand there, unless you were a greeter, in which case you had to say whatever the stupid tagline was at the time. It was something like, hey, how's it going? Or hey, what's up? <laughs> or sometimes there would be something really awkward about like how great the jeans fit. You'd have to say like, hey, what's up? Have you heard how great our jeans fit? Thankfully, I, I was not a greeter. I guess I wasn't <laughs> hot enough to be a greeter. But I actually do remember being scolded for talking, scolded for speaking to someone during my very first shift. I was assigned a room towards the back of the store. <laughs> and I think it's pretty well known that the further back in the store that you were assigned, like the less hot you were. So like the hottest people were the greeters and then you got stuck in the back. So I was stuck in the back and I had nothing to do. So the manager told me to refold a table of t-shirts that was perfectly folded, you guys. Like no one had been in my room the entire time I had been in the store. There was no one had touched it. She told me to refold the whole table. And I spoke to somebody, the guy who was working in the fitting room area, which was like right in front of my room, and we got in trouble. <laughs> this was my first shift, which also happened to be my last shift, my only shift, <laughs> we will say. Guys, I quit after one shift. One shift I lasted at Hollister. I have never quit a job so fast. I mean, literally one shift. It was like five hours and I had had enough. The funniest thing to me about the whole ordeal was that after that shift, I went home and I realized I was not going back to this place. I wasn't wearing the skinny jeans. I wasn't refolding perfectly folded t-shirts. I wasn't going to not talk for five hours. I mean, have you met me? I am a talker. So I called the store to let them know that I was going to give my two weeks notice because I wasn't just going to quit. I was going to give notice. And I asked them if they wanted it in writing or whatever. This was back in the day when you did things on paper. So I thought, you know, I would write out a resignation and bring it in. <laughs> and the manager that I talked to was like, what's your name again? And I told him my name, he goes, nope, I'll just add your name to the list. And then just told me I never had to come back. 
<laughs> and this is hilarious because they hired huge groups of people all at once because I guess it was just so common that people would quit right away. So he was not phased by this at the least and I don't even think they ever learned my name but I <laughs> never went back after that one shift and that was my very short-lived Hollister career. I did however probably spend at least three times the amount of money that I made in that one shift on clothes. So I guess Hollister won <laughs> in that regard. So a while ago, I pulled some of you guys online and asked for your stories about working at Abercrombie or Hollister back in the days, and you guys had some wild stories. There was a lot of theft in these stories, especially managers, but just in general, a lot of employee theft, lots of just like very problematic behavior, especially around looks and weight and things like that. A lot, a lot of fraternization amongst very young managers and staff. It seems like all of the managers were like 20 years old. <laughs> like everybody in the store was really young. Lots of people got fired. Lots of people were drunk and hung over a lot. It just sounds like from all of your experiences, these stores were essentially frat houses that sold really expensive clothes. But I will say not all the stories were bad. There were some positive ones. There were some really positive stories about some managers that like really looked out for their staff. But you know, for the most part, there were there was some questionable stuff going on in those stores. So I'm gonna wrap this episode up with a few snippets of stories which are directly from you guys about working at Abercrombie & Fitch or Hollister in the 2000s. These are in no particular order and again these are in your exact words. So here goes. I got scolded for being too tan in December and was told to stop tanning until the next season. <laughs> This one really made me laugh because that would have been me. Had I ever gotten a job at Abercrombie, they would have been horrified by the level of tan that I was in January in Wisconsin. Someone else said, I was a greeter and I cut my hair. Management freaked out and told me that I needed DM approval for that. There were so many stories like this about people who got a haircut or dyed their hair or otherwise changed something about their appearance and either got directly scolded in trouble or just had their shifts cut or got moved to another place in the store. Like imagine a company doing something like this now. And we just like thought that this was normal, I guess. This person said, one girl came in after a crazy night out and fell asleep in the go back bin, <laughs> which if you've never worked retail is where you put all of the clothes from like the fitting rooms or the registers that people decide that they don't want. Usually it's sitting outside of the fitting room and you take it and you put it, you know, back where it goes. So apparently this person's coworker decided that a pile of clothes looked like a great place for a nap. And there were so many stories about coworkers and managers often being just wildly hungover, which again, just makes sense given that everybody in these stores seemed to be under the age of 25. I worked at Hollister and quit by requesting off via computer every day for three months. <laughs> Honestly, this is genius. This made me cackle so hard when I first read it because this is what I should have done and they never even would have noticed. They didn't even care. This one's bad. I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch 2007 to 2008 and we had a meeting about weight to explain that heavier girls would work in the back while thinner girls were the model on the floor. I mean, I don't even need to con that's just disgusting. Interviewed at Hollister and was told that I needed to dye my hair blonde for the beach vibe. <laughs> I wonder where they do the line at blonde though because my hair was very blonde, like platinum blonde, and I feel like that was too blonde for them. But I guess they didn't like brunettes either, so it was really a sweet spot you had to hit. I showed up for the interview with my resume and the manager told me he didn't need it because they were hiring for looks. I mean, not surprising, honestly. I guess at least he was honest about it. And also good for this person for bringing in a resume to an interview at a mall store because I don't think I even had a resume at that time or any clue how to write one. So bravo to them. And my personal favorite, the best one, my manager went on rock of love. 
I need to know which season. I need to know who it was. This is hilarious. Can you imagine being a teenager and working at the mall and having your manager be like, I'm quitting because I'm going on a reality show. And then you're like, cool, what reality show? And they say rock of love. <laughs> Amazing, incredible. I mean, that is, that is a good story. I'm sure there are plenty more crazy stories where that came from. There are just endless stories that I've heard from people. I mentioned it briefly, but if you are interested in more about Abercrombie, but especially about just all of this gross behavior in the 2000s with staff and, and things that happen in the stores, I do really recommend the Netflix documentary. It's called White Hot. I think it's called The White Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie Fitch. And there also have been a ton of articles written about them as well as their former CEO who is really kind of the worst of the worst and has been accused of very vile behavior. So there's plenty out there to continue this rabbit hole if you wish. I also must say that I think their rebrand re in recent years is genuinely one of the most impressive retail comebacks I have ever seen and just a really fascinating case in branding, which I love. I, I think branding is so interesting. I'm a sucker for good branding. I think it's really, really important. And this is just such a great example of branding really done right, especially for a brand that had a really bad reputation. I mean, Abercrombie was all but dead and has had this massive comeback. So it's pretty crazy. And I could really go on and on about Abercrombie, but I won't. I will leave you here. I hope you enjoyed this little conversation. I always enjoy our, our little time travels together. If you did enjoy this episode, I would so appreciate it if you would share it with a friend or somebody else who might enjoy it. It really does help me when you guys share the episodes and help get the word out about the podcast. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And I will be back next week, so I'll talk to you guys then. Bye.